There you go. Okay, well, here we are for our kickoff meeting of uh, Bernardo Kastrup's uh, An Ideal World. I'm really excited that all of you showed up. This is, uh, this is kind of a new experience for us uh, longtime cafe goers, eh, John? <laughs> where, <laughs> where sometimes it's just a little chat between a couple of us. We've had up to 20 people on occasion. We've had up to 20. We've had as few as two. So. <laughs> so. But hopefully we'll get a little more... Get yeah. stable around here. Thanks. Yeah, well, you want to get stable. All right, John. We're waiting for that one, okay? <laughs> I like the rest of us. So I'd like to welcome everybody here at, at any rate. And um, I, I was interested in, when I read the book, I thought this might be something that would be of interest to others. And apparently it is. Um, so we got a pretty good reaction on the, the conference itself. And there was no time like the present to, to start working through the book. And so it seemed like a good time to do that today. And since we do have a lot of uh, new faces here and we all don't know each other, I thought one of the best places to start would simply to be to go around so that everyone can kind of introduce themselves. And in light of what it is that we want to do, read this book and do some critical thinking about it is kind of let everyone else know well what motivated you to to participate and like why why would you want to why do you care why would you even bother um ontology is not exactly i, I don't see it trending a lot on twitter for example um though i'm not on twitter a lot but it's not a big i don't think it's a big catchy uh, discipline that people are following. So when we find people that are interested in things that are that obscure, I, I think that's uh, interesting in and of itself. So would anyone like to start or should I just go ahead since I'm talking anyhow and I'll get that out of the way <laughs> and then the, the room is open for everyone else. Okay, good. My name, yeah. uh, okay, good. All right, my name's Ed. Um, that's what everyone calls me. Um, I'm located in uh, central Germany, in Bad Hersfeld, and um, I'm an expat American. I was stationed here a long time ago, and um, after the Army, I taught school for a while at a private boarding school, and then my family and I moved to California, and we spent 14 years there, and then we came back in uh, 1997 and um, I've been here ever since. So I feel very comfortable here in Germany. And I originally come from Western Pennsylvania, uh, Pittsburgh, for those people who've ever heard of steel and heavy metal, a lot of smog, a lot of pollution when I was growing up. But I don't get back there very often. I've actually uh, come to realize I've, I've lived longer not at home than I was at home. So I'm, I'm officially escaped from Western Pennsylvania. And I was part of the uh, Gapeser reading that we did here on Infinite Conversations. That was back in 2016. Seems like a long time ago. And I've been a regular participant in the cafes that we have, and they usually take place at this time. Um, not because this is the time they're scheduled for, it's just this is the time that the people that participated could meet up. And we've kicked around a lot of topics that have to do with consciousness and, and uh, integrality, uh, where we're going as, as a species, uh, what might be down the road, how, how is reality constructed. These are the kind of topics that we keep talking about and not talking about and, and discussing in different ways. And this book seemed like a good way to focus in on something very fundamental about it all. Um, we're all confronted with that uh, physicalist view of the universe that um, matters all that matters and nothing else matters at all. But um, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that that's the, the most efficient and effective way to go about uh, dealing with it. So um, when, I, when I read Castro's book, I thought there's a lot of detail and technical things that are in there that I'm not sure I understand completely. And it would be nice to have them have someone to bounce that off of, just as a sanity check, 
you know, like, am I thinking okay? And is, is he being clear in what he's doing? And so that's why I was kind of motivated to do this. And as it is on infinite conversations, for those of you who may be new to this, um, if you don't do it, it won't get done. <laughs> because we're all volunteers here, right? <laughs> except for those people in the background who are actually uh, dedicated to this, like, like Doug, who, who helps a lot with technical things when the rest of us have no clue what we're doing. But, uh, and that's how we manage. So that's why I'm here, because I thought it would be an interesting project. And, and there seemed to be some interest that had been kicked around. And, and now that interest is manifested. So I'm real excited about where we're going to go. So that's who I am and why I'm here. And let's hear, let's hear from the rest of you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for <clears throat> making this happen, Ed. I think it's a, I, I have followed um, Kastrup over the years. I've read two or three of his books. I have not read this one. Um, I've watched a lot of his interviews and his uh, interactions with other, other persons uh, who, like J.F. Martell, who's been a, a visitor here, and many of us have, have followed his work, uh, the two of them had a, a back and forth um, conversation and uh, that I thought was ex extremely interesting. <clears throat> I guess what draws me to this is um, what is the opposite of materialism? Is it idealism? What is the opposite of idealism? Is it materialism? I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, I'm, I'm interested in that idea that uh, Owen Barfield, someone else we've read, he said that there's uh, opposites that engage and enhance each other through opposition. Um, we want to do that. We want to have that happen. Um, because it seems like whatever worldview we take on, how do we stay in that worldview? Or do we change our worldview over a lifetime? Uh, or do we go back and forth from different worldviews when circumstances require us to do so? So I think those are the kind of questions that I'm asking myself. And uh, as I recall, J.F. Martel said that he is not a materialist. He calls him, nor is he an idealist. He calls himself a realist. So I think that's another, um, another um, character that we can invite to perform in this play. <clears throat> so my big questions here as I start out, and I'm sure this will be, will be revised as I hear whatever everybody else is interested in, is what is valuable in materialism, idealism, realism, spiritualism, which is not always the same as idealism. So I think these are big ticket items, and, as, as, uh, and I think it's really worth uh, the time and energy we put into this to sort this out and bring perhaps a little clarity to um, a, a real smorgasbord of meta metaphysical views. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Hey, I might introduce myself. My name is Daniel. I'm living in Portugal. I'm half Finnish, half Portuguese. My father was Portuguese, mother Finnish. And uh, I don't have any background on conceptual, conceptually on philosophy. So I come more from the experiential side. I mean, I have had experiences since my early age We that I am hoping, well, at least currently I see that the idealism uh, can give a framework, a metaphysical framework, a metaphysical uh, background to these experiences. I'm talking about out-of-body experiences, uh, lucid dreaming, and also more recently I've been enthusiastic about some tryptamines, if um, name it, well, psychedelics, but tryptamines, and namely 5-MeO DMT, which is, has been quite revealing and which goes pretty much from what I understand um, according to the main postulates of idealism. I discovered Bernardo's ideas 
some months ago and I have read one of his book um, and I'm looking forward to go deeper into the to understand and because I think they really helped me to integrate the, the experiences and the make sense and it's uh, um, I remember back in the when I was I'm 43 now and back when I was 20 I have a kind of a crisis because I was in the college university st studying social psychology and at that time my experiences I didn't have I was kind of disappointed because all that was uh, teached uh, was based on the physicalist paradigm and I felt um, alienated I feel the even uh, a bit disappointed and frustrated that I couldn't, uh, that uh, they were dismissed as some uh, brain-based uh, hallucination, to put it grossly. So now somehow I feel that finally I have found that there is a very, um, uh, to seriously, to be taken seriously, I mean, a strong argument as the book itself claims that this is a book for the academics, uh, for the uh, more rigorous and technical arguments conceptually, um, not for the mainstream crowd, general public, but mainly to the academics. So yeah, in that sense, I'm uh, very in, interested to educate myself and sophisticate myself and learn from you guys. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you for the opportunity. Hello, uh, this is Jaime. So I'm a Spanish. Um, actually, was born in uh, Palma de Mallorca. Uh, so German. So people based in Germany probably will know uh, pretty well because it's full of Germans in uh, during the summertime or almost every time in the year. So um, so it's my first uh, actually um, uh, Cosmo Cafe and uh, Infinite conversation. Um, and uh, and 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 uh, basically, I came here because I'm following Castro for a few months. So I discovered him uh, probably six months ago, and I started, I mean, watching some videos in YouTube. So I'm subscribed to his channel, and also watch his um, uh, PhD uh, uh, defense, uh, the, the second one. Um, which, which is uh, quite interesting uh, to watch the, the full, let's say, kind of a version there um, uh, because it explains quite succinctly, um, uh, let's say, all his ontology um, and uh, and then th there are questions, obviously, from from the tribunal, and um, and I found it uh, interesting. And then I started reading uh, quite a lot um, essays that he's got also. The book that I've read is uh, Brief Peaks Beyond, uh, which I really loved it, uh, which gives uh, uh, precisely that, right? So uh, um, a kind of an appetizers uh, for, I think, his uh, more, uh, uh, let's say, substantial books that I will certainly uh, uh, go and, 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 and read them. And also, uh, I don't know you guys, if you are, um, subscribed to uh, his um, he's got a Google um, site there where there are few people having conversations and threads etc so I'm there and uh, following some of the conversations that the ones that are uh, I mean it's very difficult to follow all the conversations because there's so much activity going on in there but uh, and there are some people really very um, you know kind of a uh, all the time uh, posting and uh, so it's it's difficult but at least uh, the few that I'm really uh, interested uh, then I'm following and, and perhaps contributing I find that interaction also very uh, interesting but certainly uh, I also appreciate now my first, very first few minutes have been here I really uh, like them because I can see that we are people from very different backgrounds I appreciate very much uh, also uh, uh, so, sorry, I think I, I uh, Daniel, uh, yeah, that you came from more this experiential side because I come more from the intellectual side actually. So I'm a, a, as an engineer as a background. I've been uh, pretty much uh, most of my life uh, a hardcore materialist, 
okay um, and very much uh, you know science for me it uh, has been always uh, very important uh, as a as a source of knowledge um, but uh, um, from from the very start from the very beginning I had uh, always a, a sort of intuition that it was a, a sort of a limited you know um, uh, method and and um, and uh, I haven't got uh, really maybe clear experiences, but I've got some kind of flashes of uh, intuition that there is something else. And uh, and and when I I, I read uh, started reading uh, Bernardo, uh, I I I I I really like very much. Um, I think it's if I have to choose uh, one of the philosophers at this moment that uh, uh, um, I really like is him because. Um, it, it comes from this intellectual, uh, logical kind of angle. So he tries to uh, put an intellectual framework, which I think is what it works, especially for more for the Western culture, and and really caught me. Um, uh, and then from there is is what I uh, you can see in, in one of his books. Uh, he says that this gives you permission to open more to the experiential, uh, you know, uh, side, uh, where is that you you really can see. The truth itself, right? Rather than trying to explain it, or or uh, which will be always um, uh, limited, uh, what you can you can uh, ex experience from that, from, from using the language of logic and mathematics and physics, etc. So very interesting in, in in knowing you guys and meeting with you and and uh, looking forward to you know uh, uh, an ongoing conversation because uh, I am really. Uh, um, fan of uh, Bernardo's work I'm following and uh, have j started to be honest uh, I started again back uh, it, it was one of the topics that I liked when I was a kid uh, well kid high school etc so philosophy and now I am starting reading again uh, classic uh, classic uh, philosophy and I'm really enjoying it. I'm seeing uh, with different lens, and I enjoyed it very much. And now for me, it's uh, my kind of hobby out of work. By the way, for your information, I work uh, in Vodafone um, as as a product uh, engineer. Uh, but but then my my re my real passion is it's uh, it's uh, yeah uh, philosophy, and in particular, I'm very interested in idealism. I, <clears throat> sorry, I have a bit of flu. Hi to everyone. Um, my name is Marco Masi. I also, <clears throat> I also escaped like Ed, but not from the US, but from Italy. And uh, <laughs> now I'm living in Germany. Germany there uh, for some time, I worked as a researcher <clears throat> in physics and then later went also to teaching. This gave me an idea how things work nowadays globally, I think, when it comes to education and to science. And my interest <clears throat> for metaphysical questions, so to speak, uh, was almost always there. Uh, Already from the younger age, I was interested in yoga and Eastern philosophy. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> Wait a moment. <coughs> and so I came to know um, more the Eastern philosophical, metaphysical uh, philosophies than the Western ones. <clears throat> and I must say I'm a latecomer uh, for Kastrup because I discovered him, I think, a couple of months ago. Uh, not, not very, it's not very long. I didn't read any book of him, but I read a couple of papers of him, some papers he has published several papers and so also from there you can get an idea and a background from what his philosophy is and this led me also to reconsider the western philosophy i think must i'm i'm 
actually <laughs> um, trying to um, recover um, Western philosophies, especially the, the, the idealism, um, the, the teachings of idealism, and um, because I, I think they are very relevant also to things like quantum mechanics and so on. If you there are so many interpretations out there about quantum mechanics and so on. You know that. No? And I think the idealist uh, standpoint is, at least for me, the one who best describes the, uh, how, can, how can you say, that? This, this weird world of quantum mechanics. And um, so uh, I got also attracted to his, uh, to his character in some sense, because when you follow him on um, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and and the the, the papers, uh, the online the on online articles that he uh, published, he is a, in a sort of war against materialism. He is an anti-physicalist, and <laughs> uh, yeah, this is a, quite dangerous because I don't know if it's necessary to try to convince others of the opposite of materialism. But in any case, I mean, uh, he, he moves, he moves a lot of water, I think. And in a certain sense, uh, he, he is bringing back this old problem that is uh, the question of uh, consciousness, the so-called hard problem of consciousness, where the physicalist approach uh, didn't didn't advance by a by a iota right? and since uh, the times of Descartes, uh, when it comes to the hard problem of consciousness, there has been zero uh, progress. And I think people are now realizing that there is something missing. So there are things that we cannot just capture by science only and by mind only. Um, so I think he's an interesting character. I will continue to follow him, and that's why I'm here. Doug, do you want to go first? Hello. Um, I wonder if Castro would see himself as a character or uh, an actor. I uh, think he, he's playing a good role, it sounds like, but uh, he he's very interesting. Um, I myself, I, I feel like I'm not all that interesting, so I'll, I'll spare you, other than my location, I, I live in Kentucky, and I'm, I'm a family man. Um, I love listening in to conversations such as this, more so than directly contributing, but at the same time, your contributions uh, influence my way of seeing the world. Um, so I'm looking forward to definitely the, the fresh faces here. Uh, I think it's been a while since we've had a, a hardcore materialist, as you say, Jamie. So it'll be good to have your perspective as a, the antithesis or, or the antidote, whatever it might be. But um, So I, I hope I can participate in future conversations. Um, I know this will be a good one, so that's all I need to say now. I'm in Southern California. I grew up in the 60s. I have an eclectic, raw, hippie, take no, no shit off of anybody, even though I love everybody. I also have a heightened, I've come to appreciate a heightened kinetic sensibility that's permeable in terms of in terms of what comes in me and what goes out, ideas are real. They're just as real as persons or anything else, but they operate on a different movement, frequency, vibe, whatever you want to call it. So I'm, I come to this because I enjoy conversing and like Doug, absorbing and receiving. And I have a position. My job, though, is to stay as open as possible to what's there. but. I'm just confused. I don't see or I don't feel, I guess, the consternation of the split between the two. 
I don't know why that is other than maybe because I did some drugs back in the 60s and I've had some traumatic experiences. And so it's put me in a place of experiential in terms of experience of it's all fucking real. That's all I can say. And I like what's be, I like the language of Bernardo because I've read the first part, the front matter. I like the flow of his language. I I I I like where he's going, where he's been. Words flow through me and they have an effect, and I just pay attention to that. So thank you very much. You want muted, John? Do you want to say something? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. All right. I didn't. I didn't want to. I didn't want to preempt anything. I. We've got a really motley crew here. This is great. <laughs> For me, things can't be diverse enough. I'm kind of like Michael, except I came from the other side of that continent. Um, we're about the same. I'm retired now, so I don't. I don't have a. I never had a career by the way. I, and I also never worked in a job that I was qualified for. So yeah, I've had one of those, I kind of got here wherever. And I've studied a lot of things in my life. I'm interested in topics like this for all of the reasons that all of you have stated. Um, I, I wonder a lot about reality. I've always wondered about it. As far back as I can remember, it's always struck me as is odd that there's anything. That's the old Leibniz question. Why is there something and not nothing? You know, um, well, I don't know. Not, nobody really knows, but, but we all, we kick it around a lot. And in a, in a lot of the, the discussions that we've had here on this platform on infinite conversations, and especially in the cafe, we've kicked around a lot of people who have thought about these kinds of things. John mentioned Owen Barfield. We had a session on him. He has one way of looking at how did, how did we get here and why are we here and where are we going? Um, I had mentioned John Gapeser. He, his name gets mentioned a lot more than some of you um, may feel comfortable with if you've never, never encountered him. Uh, he's a very familiar name around here. Uh, one of the very first sessions I had mentioned that we, I was engaged in here was a reading of his, um, seminal work, which is called The Ever-Present Origin. And it, it outlines a, I'm gonna call it a model for lack of a better word at the moment, but he kind of outlines this five-stage model of consciousness unfoldment. Um, we didn't always, as a species, experience and see the world the way we do today. And he describes the series of mutations that, that humanity has gone through and his postulation is he wrote the ever present origin back in 1949 1952 where the two parts were published and he suggested at that time that we were going through another mutation of consciousness what they called the integral uh, structure what he called the integral structure of consciousness and integrality and in the integral structure of consciousness is a theme that that gets kicked around a lot in a lot of circles some of you may have heard of or are familiar with a, um, a gentleman by the name of Ken Wilbur, who's very active in that in that uh, in that realm. Um, we also did a reading um, of uh, Sri Aurobindo's uh, "The Life Divine" here on site, which uh, took a little bit of time. But Aurobindo is is one figure who has been who's an Eastern thinker. He's he's uh, Indian, um, but he and Gapeser talk about very similar things and there's a lot of overlap between uh, how they, they view where we are and where we came from and how we are the way we are and where we may be going kind of things. So these kinds of topics have been, have been a big part of things that we, we've talked about. But as Michael mentioned, you know, I, I also find Castro um, a person who's He's relatively easy to read, even when he's writing in a very technical way. He's, he's got a, he is a character, um, but I think you have to be if you're going to do what he's doing. Uh, one of the, 
the points John brings this up a lot, and you know, and because it's it's so permanent, the the dominant paradigm in most of Western science is physicalism or materialism or whatever it is we want to call that. That matter matters kind of thing. That's the that's where it all starts, and but it has its limits, and then and we bump when we come to the consciousness question. We we just bump on the limits of it. You know, well, well how how do we how do we know that we know things, or how do we experience things? And and I always found that Daniel Dennett is a big proponent of um, what what they call big word epiphenomenalism that that consciousness is just kind of a byproduct of chemical processes that happen in the brain. It really shouldn't be there, but it's there. But the only reason that, it, that we can talk about it being there is because we're conscious. And this is what I think Marco was pointing to is when it doesn't really help us to say, well, it shouldn't be there, but it's there. But we, we still have to deal. My feeling is, well, if it's there, we need to deal with this. Let's go back to what, what Daniel said. Um, Altered states of mind, whether whether drug induced or otherwise, are real. Enough people experience them, and enough people have to deal with them that it seems to me it would be reasonable for us to have some sensible way of understanding what it is that we're dealing with, or try to understand what we're dealing with. And the, the so-called physicalist paradigm. This is one of the points that Casper makes. Doesn't seem to help us. It just it kind of stops because consciousness shouldn't be there, but it's there. So what do you do about it? Well, how do you deal with it? And so I like the fact, and I think this is one of the reasons that he's so so adamant about a lot of things. Uh, when you read his very early books, so, uh, why, mater why materialism is baloney. Okay, I mean the title says it all. <laughs> <laughs> and he was he was very provocative in those in those texts and in those those early writings because he wanted to awaken the sensitivity that a lot of people have that maybe there's another way of looking at the problem maybe there's another way of looking for an answer and 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 I I, I found that because I I happened to run into a couple of his, his books along the first one I ever read was also Brief Peaks Beyond which I just I just found exceedingly entertaining because he was talking about things a lot of people just don't want to talk about. And then John introduced us to another, to another book. This was Irreducible Mind, by uh, edited by the people at the University of uh, Virginia. Um, right there, you go. And Beyond Physicalism. That's a, that's another one. These are these are huge tomes, but they're they're collections of essays where academics are actually trying to deal with so-called anomalies, psychic phenomena, um, past lives, uh, reincarnation, all of those things that nobody in mainstream, in the mainstream wanted to talk about. And since, and since they were being ignored, there's been a growing chorus of people who said, well, maybe we need to look at this a little differently. And one of the, the I think one of the disciplines that really kicked this off, Marco brought this up, was quantum physics. That whole quantum, there's a quantum change when, when quantum physics shows up. Because now a lot of things that we thought made perfectly good sense don't really make so much sense at all. And we have, we get down far enough into the nitty gritty and we find there's neither nit nor grit. It's just like, okay, so what do we do now? You know, <laughs> this all kind of goes away. And so people have, there's been a growing movement is, is actually too much to say of people saying, well, okay, well, let's, let's look at this differently. Let's take another approach. Let's, let's maybe take another starting point. Uh, one of the other people that, that, that we've read here, for example, was Peter Sloterdijk, a German philosopher. And he has a, a, a very unique way of understanding reality in the world. But to me, it was also kind of rooted in this, in this matter matters paradigm, right? So the way I refer to it, that it was a materialist physical, everything just starts with what's there. And so there's a lot of things, and he was talking about a lot of things that are 
not generally talked about, but he was talking about them in ways that you always got the feeling, at least for me, that was my understanding, my interpretation of what I thought I was reading there, was that it's just, they're just anomalies. They're just, they're, they, that shouldn't be that way, but it is, and let's move on. And I don't think that's, that's helpful. I, I like to tr understand as much as I can, as often as I can. <clears throat> And all of us here, all of us, Daniel mentioned it, Michael mentioned it, I didn't specifically, you know, I, I also, um, about that, I'm of that 60s generation, uh, there's, a, there's a saying where I, I come from that says, if you can remember the 60s, you weren't there. So, <laughs> so, so no, so no uh, Michael, it's not the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> That's not it. Okay, you can't use that as an excuse. And you you have experiences, and I and this is the, for me important at the at the moment because this is the, kind of the transition. This is what Daniel emphasized, and this is what we've all mentioned along the way: is we all have these experiences, and we all believe these experiences are real, but we don't really have a way of describing them in a way that. Maybe we personally feel comfortable with, but it's very difficult to communicate to others who don't see it that way. I, you'll you'll bear with me, Jamie. But when you, as a physicalist, talk to someone who's not a physicalist, it's like you're talking past each other. And when and when you realize, well, maybe you have to step back and, and take a look at at how do we express these things to others so that they understand. You realize that there are some very we all make very fundamental assumptions about reality, and most of us aren't aware that those assumptions are being made. And so part of my, my motivation for you know, instituting this group was for us to all just have that opportunity to, to examine our, our assumptions. Uh, back when I was uh, studying at uh, Gießen, I took a couple of philosophy courses, and at the time in Frankfurt, there was a philosopher by the name of Carl, who said that the whole purpose of philosophy was to question one's own assumptions. That, that was the only reason that it existed as a, as a discipline. Well, he was of a minority view, I can assure you, because at the time, everybody else was very part, they were very Popperian. Karl Popper was a very popular philosopher at the time. Critical rationalism was kind of like the dominant school of thought back in the in the 70s <clears throat> and that that all started with there's the world is out there and it's real and it has nothing to do with us and somehow we have to figure it out and what what Kastrup is doing I think essentially is he's challenging that view and saying well is there an alternative and how can we go about doing that and so I found this book particularly interesting because unlike his other books, and oh, by the way, this reminds me, um, Jamie, you had mentioned his uh, PhD uh, defense and whatnot. If you, if you have links to any of these things, post them in the conference. Yes, you do. Yeah, we, we, we love to go watch stuff um, that others have seen and, and have mentioned, okay? That would be real helpful. Because it helps give a little insight into how, how how he's functioning and what he's doing. What I found interesting about this book was he knew it was going to be a book, but the people who were publishing his papers didn't. He actually, he tried, and that was this whole peer review process. Um, if you're going to get published academically, you have to submit things and then reviewers look at them and say, oh, this is worth publishing. And if they decide they're going to publish it, then somebody will work with you to Put it into the form, shape, and tenor that whatever the publication would like to see. So he he chose to go that route, and I since it was part of his PhD, um, this this is what you do. He said, "I'll play the game. You just have to find enough players out there who are willing to listen to what you have to say." And fortunately, and that is also an indication of the sign of the times, that there were enough publications out there who were willing to entertain 
let's call it the non-standard or non-dominant view of reality and let him, let him at least make his case. Uh, some of them I am sure because, well, the others will come in here and put him in his place or because, well, maybe we, we doubt a little bit ourselves how this is going to go because as we all know, every publication has its own bias. Whoever puts it together, whoever says we ought to do a journal on this, or we ought to do, you know, uh, uh, some kind of a, a, a technical uh, publication in, in this regard. Well, they already have a view of what they want to, want to publish, how, what things sh should be like. And it's, so it's, and it's good that there's a lot of them. It just shows the truth that there's a lot of different opinions out there. But this it needs to go beyond opinions. This needs to go to the point where somebody actually says something that's worth listening to and others can critically evaluate and engage. And that's what he, he was trying to do with these. And I, and I found that approach um, fascinating because he said, okay, well then let's play the game and let's see if we can get these pieces of the puzzle, as he called them, published. And they did. And then he was able to take those and organize them in a way that, that makes for those of us who read a book length text, a coherent argument. And said, this is how I see this unfolding and developing. And so what he does in the book basically is simply, he puts all the pieces together and provides some glue and some transitions to get from one step to the next. So, and I, I found the approach fascinating in and of itself. And so that was another reason why I thought this might be a, a good way to do it. John, you want to say something? Please do. Yes, I'd, I'd like to respond. And thank you very much, Ed, for uh, offering a, a history of our particular study group and the different kind of readings we've done. Pretty eclectic, actually. Um, <laughs> and I, um, I think it was Daniel who mentioned lucid dreaming and out-of-body experience. And um, I... Uh, I, I, I failed to mention that I, my background is in acting, in theater, director, writer, a body worker, a gay activist. Um, I'm not an academic. I dropped out of college. It just seemed to me a total waste of time for my particular purposes. Um, I, sometimes I have regretted that, but not really, because I have the internet now, and there, there are courses online all over the place, and you know, the best professors in the world are offering lectures, you know, on YouTube. And so I can, I can do a lot of catch up, but I really do appreciate that there are persons who are really gifted at the logical and mathematical, which I am not. And some of you are here who probably are gifted in those areas, but I have a, a very deep interest in um, what transdisciplinary learning so that we can go from different disciplines we could be an expert in, in one area and a total beginner in another area that we can come together and hopefully ask good enough questions. If you're not an expert in the area, you can ask good enough questions of the expert and, um, and vice versa. And the expert has a chance to break down what they think they already know into something that uh, communicates beyond their specialty. And as you all know, if you've listened to a lot of experts get together, they tend not to agree on very much. <laughs> so I think these are the kind of tensions and stresses that we're all feeling uh, currently as we think about um, AI and the singularity and uploading our consciousness. Um, uh, the idea that we could go into outer space and colonize um, the, the solar system. I've heard physicists actually talk about this. Um, as a very real reality. Um, so this relationship between our consciousness, our technology, and the interplay, I think that's a very, some very pressing and, and some urgent concerns that we all have. Uh, and I think this is what's front and center in Kastrup's uh, approach, because he is an academic. He's got several, couple PhDs, but he's, he's worked in the area of physics but obviously he has uh, lots of other interests and he has declared uh, on a couple of occasions that <clears throat> this, uh, that I think he, he's offering a binary in this book, which ontology, physicalism or idealism, makes more sense in view of the available neuroscientific evidence. 
So he's already posing this question in the introduction here uh, in a kind of binary. And I believe he's operating in a, in the academia, academic world, he's taking an analytic approach <clears throat> that is very uh, polarized. And I do feel that there's a bit of a warrior in him and mm -hmm. um, yeah. that he is attacking the presuppositions of the dominant paradigm, which would be, you know, if this were, if this paradigm were a benevolent one, there wouldn't be any need to attack it. But I think it's so deficient uh, in so many different ways that our actual experiences of near-death experience, out-of-body experience, lucid dreaming, singing, dancing, rocking a baby to sleep, smelling a rose, all of these extraordinary and ordinary experiences just can't be accounted for by this current version of materialism. Um, there may be a version of materialism that could emerge, that could be more adequate than the one that dominates now. So this is my interest, and I think uh, why Castro is so uh, interesting and compelling a figure, because I think he holds uh, these tensions and he explores them in a very, um, very happy to take on an oppositional stance because he thinks these guys are full of shit. <laughs> and, he's, and, and they're also taking off of the table all of the experiences that most of us hold very dear. And it's very easy if you take all of that off the table to say what's on the table, what we've decided is on this table is all that there is. That's reality. So I think this is a, a tension that um, probably many of us are are holding in our own ways. And I hope we can bring forward in, in these conversations in this forum, this public forum, uh, different points of view and where we may feel confused or where we may feel, uh, you know, very satisfied and, um, you know, take it from there. So thank you. Uh, I just want to add to John's metaphor is, I think he's questioning the fuckers that created the table. You know, they've created a table and he's challenging the very table that they've created. And they've told us, you can't come to the table unless you agree with us. And he's questioning that. And I kind of like that, but I'm a hip hippie on steroids sometimes when it comes to things. Um, yes, but what I would like also to point out is what is at stake here is not just uh, some philosophical theories, uh, materialism versus uh, idealism or spiritualism or whatever. It's not just about having a worldview and that's it. Um, I think what is at stake here is a concept of a society, of what the human being is, of how we should regulate also our life, how we should conceive our relationship with, with others, how we should practice also very material sciences, like, like for example, I mean, in medicine, yeah? it's, it's now, I'm, since I'm a little kid, I hear about the placebo effect, yeah? for example. But it is, yes, now they accept it, but there is no conception on how to, uh, apply it in practice, um, not in the in strictly physicalist uh, allopathic um, medicine. And these sciences which are supposed to cure us and to decide our lives are see us just like machines. We are just biological robots. And this is not only a philosophical issue, it's also how you conceive uh, the, your practice uh, uh, and, and we have uh, what I see here very often people lamenting for example um, that they uh, have a very bad relationship with their doctors uh, and or psychologist or whoever whatever and um, and this I think in well they are also 
of course, other causes, but it, it comes also from a standpoint, a point of view that I'm here, you are there, you're just a machine, and I have to repair you like uh, a, a, a car. Huh? Mm, if we will be able to go beyond this strictly physicalist uh, attitude, I think this will change a lot of things also in practice, also in society, also how we conceive, also politics probably, because also the politics, the politicians are, are afraid to take decisions which are not in line with the physicalist uh, uh, idea. And, um, well, I, I don't digress here because otherwise. Um, and this is the real thing that is happening now, I think. More or less subconsciously, we are still, it is something in the um, collective unconscious. It's still not uh, there yet completely, but I believe that in the next well, years, perhaps not, but in the next decades, there will be a rising um, desire of the people uh, to something that goes beyond the strictly materialist uh, uh, attitude and point view, point of view. And I think, well, I can just make, let's see, we are making a record of this video. So in 10 years, 20 years, let's look it back again. But my, <laughs> my prediction is that we will see that all this artificial intelligence stuff uh, will not work out as we, as we hope for. We think that uh, we will, soon have conscious machines and self-driving cars and humanoids walking on the street and, and they will go to work for us. And all. I, I bet that this will not be realized. And there, this will be probably a turning point of, for physicalism, I think, that they will realize that it cannot be, there must be something more in this brain that goes beyond the brain itself, so to speak. And now we, we see also, also in science nowadays, we see, for example, now they are discovering um, that plants, plants seem to have um, a faculty, a capacity to learn and to take decisions. Uh, and this is um, called um, a, a plant, I don't know, I don't remember the name, but in any case, um, there are a lot of interesting research not just from some crazy crank, but from uh, university professors and, and academics who have made peer-reviewed, uh, have written peer-reviewed papers on the fact that plants seem to have, of course, not like a human being, of course, but seem to have some elementary uh, ability to learn from experience and to have some abilities that we thought previously only the brain or only a neural network is able to, to reproduce. But plants don't have a brain. So uh, what is this? Actually, this is still there uh, in the background, but I think in the next years, we will see a lot of change in this, in this sense. And this will be quite interesting. So I think Castro and there are also others like him who are uh, against physicalism. Uh, make, uh, paving the way to these things. I think, uh, Marco, I like very much what you just said, um, because I also, I am perhaps more interested, obviously, I want to know more and, and, and try to get uh, closest to the truth as possible. In that sense, I'm a truth seeker, right? But um, I am, uh, I think uh, it's, uh, most, I'm mostly interested in the application or the practical application and, and um, the intuition that the current uh, paradigm, uh, this physicalist paradigm, uh, it's uh, exhausted, okay? Um, it it, it, it helps us to, to make some scientific and technological progress, but clearly it's getting to a point where uh, it seems that it's, uh, I mean, we will continue to doing uh, so probably getting computers that uh, emulate uh, right thinking uh, faster and, and are able to do more tasks. Uh, I also agree with you and uh, I would also add uh, to your same bet that uh, I don't think we're going to see 
like uh, the singularity uh, sing singularitarians uh, predict uh, that I think it's in 2030 or 2040 we'll have the first conscious uh, machine. I don't think so. I think they will be probably in terms of emulation of the intelligence of the human being. Perhaps you could, you know, you could argue that they will be um, general intelligence emulating that intelligence, but I don't think they will wake up and and, and really having ha having some uh, you know experience uh, subjective experiences okay um well i'm almost sure about about that uh, but uh, i think what you just mentioned about medicine but it's also education right so uh, we see the in the curriculums that uh, so the famous stem okay so a stem is the only thing that matters matter matters so the only thing that matters is the stem um, so uh, humanities, art, etc., uh, etc., et are kind of now, you know, pushed uh, away. Like they are not really bringing any progress. Okay, and uh, I, I, I really personally, and I've got three kids, and I'm super proud because uh, I wanted to play music when I was a kid, and for whatever reason, my mother uh, was not very interested in supporting that. Uh, so I, I decided to start painting, oil painting, um, and uh, but by my three kids, for example, play instruments. I'm so proud um, just to listen to them and 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 uh, and see how they play. I think this is so important for them, really, to get all that, uh, you know, education, which is not just uh, STEM education. Um, and I think um, it, it is really necessary and uh, it's urgent, right? So, um, and uh, uh, I have many questions around some of the concepts that Castro brings and uh, I will be very happy to discuss with you uh, the next occasion. Um, but I feel that this is a much more, uh, let's say, kind of a making sense from my point of view uh, framework. Um, uh, helping uh, the spiritual but also mental uh, health okay of people really than uh, <laughs> the materialist one so I uh, you, you what resonated a lot with me and uh, again I don't think uh, I'm gonna know the truth okay even if I think a lot actually thinking probably is not gonna I, I'm almost sure that it's not gonna take me to the truth so it will be maybe, I don't know, I will be very interested, Daniel, uh, if, you, if you had any experience with uh, ME05, um, uh, that you, you also uh, talk about that, or if you know uh, someone that uh, had that. Um, I'm not fully sure I, I am uh, prepared for that, right? But I'm not really um, uh, longing for it because I know that at some point, okay, I will get there, okay, because I'm now convinced that, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it's not when you die, it's over, that's it, right? So that, that's also something that it's a truth that um, I, 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 I hold uh, dearly, okay, with my, my, I cannot explain why. Um, but, um, but it's more on the practical application and, and, and how that, change in the paradigm can help really the world to make a, an important shift that I think we need. Uh, yes, well, I'm also here obviously for the practical implications and you mentioned education and medicine and I personally have an affinity with the mental health area so i believe this uh, idealism will have also um, a lot of beneficial consequences uh, i don't know if that word is correct but um, for the mental disorders so or how we understand mental disorders how we understand depression so and this said i kind of see this as a we are regaining we are reclaiming back the meaning and the mystery because uh, materialism has uh, sabotage has killed the mystery without any foundation it has it kind of just an ego project it is like an ego trip of some persons that decided that, that this is the assumption it's their assumption personal assumption obviously it has a historical contextual uh, lineage with the illuminism so it all it's all good it's all like all have, have had their reasons to be this way. But uh, 
at this moment where the depression rates are going uh, high and uh, the people are earning eager to go beyond like they are seeing intuitively that uh, the stuff stuff is not <laughs> uh, making them happy to, to put it in a simplistic way so i think that also where idealism comes in and personally i will like back in the day when i first had my transcendental experiences uh, it would have been probably uh, an error or like say it could have had bad consequences if i would have gone to a conventional psychiatrist or conventional psychology because they I know I'm pretty sure, and I know I have uh, no, I have observed that they have would have projected their own metaphysical beliefs, and they would have um, labeled and would have framed the thing in a way that would have affect me. Like I'm glad that I had, maybe to put it in a, uh, a joke way, like I, I was a. I had this punk attitude that I didn't obey to authorities already at that time. So I was privileged, I was lucky to maintain my belief in my experience and not um, uh, give the authority to an external extern, uh, person to define my experience because I, I, I also saw tragic cases that didn't have. So this goes also in line with the anti-psychiatrist movement. You know, this, uh, I'm not going to go to the big pharma thing, but like basically psychiatrists, like the, the definitions, the DSM and uh, the, or, yeah. So I think ideal the philosophy is uh, itself. It's like we are also like regaining philosophy because it's also have been hijacked by theorists, by academics, which is just like abstractions. So um, also looking forward, like the real, the root philosophy, which is like the the love for wisdom and the love for virtuous life and the meaning and existentialism. And at that point, well, Jaime, you mentioned the 5MEO. It's, yeah, I'm, it's, just a, it's just a tool. It's like, I, I see it as a biotechnology. It's like one of the ways it's, but it's very efficient. I mean, I must say that it's like, you can get through there, through yoga, meditation, holotropic breath work, and stuff, but uh, I would say that this is like that delivers delivers it in a very consistent way, and I'm uh, all, 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 almost tempted. Like I even like in my mind, I have this is um, nothing to be serious, but it reminds me of the like when Galileo Galilei, the telescope of Galileo Galilei, when the Clary, when the at that time refused to look at the telescope. So just in a playful way, if at this moment I would place my bets kind of thing that I, we have a molecule that kind of is that thing that I will be surprised that in the heart, like um, a physicalist after the experience would be so convinced of his metaphysical assumptions that before his uh, experience. But yeah, we, yeah, I think I'm gonna leave it there, just not here. There's a lot that's been said and I'll, I'll keep it brief because I know others want to talk, but I, I appreciate what Daniel, Marco and Jamie have all said and kind of going through the education, going through the different fields. And I guess we could take the physical world view and you, you hesitated on big pharma, but that, that's kind of how it scales from, from the one-on-one -on -one psychiatric evaluation that you could have received. And all that scales up to big pharma or education, the one-on-one -on -one conversation or that could be super positive. Um, this whole time I've been creating an artwork 
and I don't have a mother or father telling me no or a teacher saying, no, pay attention to this lesson. This is what needs to happen at this moment. But in education, it trickles up to the, the bigger system. So, so maybe that's where the book will go um, into how, how we can shape the idea of the world in a, a larger scale. I, I, personally, it's easy for me to I feel like I've already read this book. I haven't gotten into it yet, but I feel like I know everything that's in there. But it's going to be presented well, perhaps, uh, and maybe have that argument that will change the perspectives of others. And that's that's what I'm seeking. I, as a, the inarticulate speech, I, I know uh, the vision from the telescope, but how do I tell others to look? Uh, how, how do we influence others to look? Um, and it doesn't have to be that we force them or insert a molecule here. It can be a simple idea. And I, I'm, I'm looking for ways to get those ideas into the, the minds of others. Uh, the only question I have, which was mentioned by Marco, that kind of getting into plant life and other, other intelligent life out there is, is is the mind, he uses the term mind and mental and the mind at large. I'm wondering if, if mind, if, it, if there's a better word or if obviously we're human, so we take that perspective, but can there be a more, a, a, a different point of view? Um, or, or when we speak of mind, is it going to be like the word God and we'll carry baggage with it? Um, so I don't know if there needs to be or what direction he'll go with the mental and the mind and the mind of life. So I'm looking to forward to seeing where we take that as well as where he's taking it. My love is like a red, red rose. That's a simile, of course, a metaphor, simile, analogy. These are communications um, where we have love which is a high, high level abstraction, and a rose, which is something concrete with attributes and qualities. And how do those attributes and qualities of the rose, like uh, the beauty, the, the fragility, the thorns, um, how do those qualities get mapped onto the abstract love? And I think the structure of the mind has much to do with our capacity for metaphor and analogy and, uh, and symbol, which is notoriously slippery um, when we start talking about this stuff because all children can figure this out. Um, and they use um, metaphor quite a bit in their communications. Um, but as we get older and we start to get educated in a very factory model education, these uh, capacities get obscured um, by, you know, other, other kinds of uh, capacities which we consider more valuable, more important. Yet, if we look at religion and we look at science and we look at the arts, they all draw upon metaphor. Science could not be communicable to anyone without metaphor as if you look at the history of physics, it's just full of stories that people have made about their experiments. So I think you've all uh, demonstrated and um, I think the necessity for finding and articulating adequately um, translations between different disciplines. So as these, as we are able to translate more adequately, and I believe um, the metaphors that we use are going to be extremely important. And I think this is something that uh, <clears throat> Bernardo Castro, I, I think definitely would agree with me. This is, his books are full of, of, of metaphor, intentionally generated metaphor. And um, I think it's out of the interplay of m multiple kinds of metaphors from multiple kinds of di uh, disciplinary, different kinds of discourse that uh, we will be moving towards a different kind of relationship, different kinds of relationships to one another, to the uh, to the environment, and um, you know, medicine and mental health, and uh, uh, you know, 
what we're going to do with uh, the surplus, <clears throat> all of these kinds of questions will, um, will change. Uh, and what kind of AI could we create when we stop uh, relying so heavily upon uh, these very narrow, narrow focus uh, views about what a human is? Um, I think if we start thinking about how Aurobindo thought about humans, or uh, Jean Gebser, um, or, or Rudolf Steiner, um, these are sort of alternative ways of knowing that uh, these thinkers um, used in their discourse. I think it would be, uh, if that could all be embraced, we would have a very different kind of AI than is being proposed now. So I think that's very stimulating to me. And I'm really stimulated by so much of what has been um, described as we all grope, grope for uh, new ways of talking about um, you know, our own actual experiences that we've had and the, ex and the experiences that have been reported to us. And how do we figure out what's bullshit and what's right or, or wrong or somewhere in between? Because we also are dealing with the possibilities, um, and that may be something that's in our, in our near future or our distant future. Um, but I think that is very different from the past and the multiple pasts that we draw from. So I heard one thinker say recently, the future has arrived too soon for most of us, and the past is currently a drag upon us. So I think that that kind of a, our, our rapid change, um, our, our relationship to, to past, present, and future is changing so rapidly uh, that many of us, I know I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, are experiencing a kind of psychic whiplash, you know, where your, your body's moving very fast in that vehicle and then all of a sudden there's an obstruction and the body wobbles <clears throat> and it can create, and ac actually can create a, uh, a a, a, a twist in the spine that uh, takes a while to recover from. So anyway, I'm just sharing that you guys with you, all of you gentlemen, and I'm hoping that we can, we can um, invite a kind of observer participant um, appreciation for um, possible uh, what might happen next, what happens next once we uh, have done this big battle that Castrop is engaged in, in this opposition between um, physicalism and idealism. Um, and when we do make sense of which, which uh, physicalism or idealism is, uh, serves us best, then what happens? I think that's very curious. And also, of course, I have a, another question about reducing matter. Something as complex as the mind reducing it to matter, which is becoming increasingly more ephemeral. What is, why bother? <laughs> I mean, this makes no sense. And I think this is what he's pointing out. It's like materialism doesn't make any sense uh, in, if you're trying to reduce something like mind to that, when we don't know what matter is. Matter is as slippery as anything else. And I think that's very curious to me. Um, so when we, do we ever touch matter? We can, I think there's a big confusion about the physical and the matter. I mean, we can touch, I can touch someone's hand. I can touch my table. I can hold an apple. I mean, that's physical, but matter, do I ever touch, um, you know, a subatomic particle? All I have is maps that people have designed. And sometimes they throw those maps out and say they were totally wrong. Like the physics I learned in, when I was in high school is no one thinks that way. Remember those little, like those electrons and there was this, you know, you, you all, you remember those maps that we were giving. They're saying it's not like that at all. Um, so we're, we're contrasting and comparing different kinds of maps based upon, I think Bernardo would say, pretty flimsy evidence. So anyway, I have lots of questions to ask and um, I'm really looking forward to, to delving into this more deeply and reading these chapters and having companions who can help me 
um, sort it out because it's not easy. So thank you. Um, and listening to everybody and and drawing on the reading that I did of Bernardo, one thing I appreciate, and this is probably a bias of mine because I've been a maintenance worker. I've done physical things with my body more than with my brain, even though I've I've tried to, I balanced out. I love reading. I love entertaining ideas and and how they affect me. But one of the things I appreciated in reading him is the kind of the kind of rigor with this tension between these two. The kind of rigor that he's trying that it's not rigid. I yes, I think he's attacking materialism or physicalism only because. It it, it 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 it's so contracted and so defensive. It's so cut off. It we've locked into our defensive system of defending about being open of the very idea of what is matter. I think we we've contracted down to a definition that that is working against us, and he's challenging that very contracted definition and. It just reminds me of the struggle Einstein had with <laughs> in his time of trying to get people to open up. Uh, I think he, in a way, he was taking materialism to an, another degree, you know, and opening it up. But I, this is the thing I think in listening to everybody, and I hope I say this right, and it is out of my experience I'm saying this and probably my bias, but until we really honor the mental and the mental tension ground that that shows up when two things are opposing that can be good or bad like john i think is pointing out i, I think unlike this conversation when i get conf in conversations with people and there's this tension and opposition people just immediately shut down they don't want to go through it they don't want to show themselves like we're showing each other that we can we can go through this. Sorry, guys, but I'm going to draw on my California metaphor. You got to surf the fucking wave. You got to get in the water, and you're gonna you're gonna fall. You're gonna you're gonna get roughed up, but uh, uh, you know you find solid ground and you decide when to go back in. So I, I'm very inspired by what I've heard from everybody. Thank you. You raise a good point, Michael. You're going to get wet. <laughs> yeah, you can't surf unless you go in the water and you're going to get wet. And it could be other things that happen as well. And I like that, that Michael brought up the idea that it's not just about this. It's actually about all of the knock-on effects. Everything that that affects, that's, that's kind of been a, a as the Germans say, a hobby horse that I've been riding around on in our readings with Sloterdijk and and, and 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 others is like well what do you fundamentally believe because if i know what that is i know how far we're going to get because it, it's depending on where you start limits are preset and in physicalism materialism there are some preset limits and you can only get so far if you deny consciousness for example well there's just a whole vast array of topics and subjects we can't talk about we can't even sit down and have a discussion we can't we can't have a chat over a beer because it's just not there it's not in your reality even though it's in mine and we all share a part of that reality we all have the bar and the beer and the and the bartender and the mirror and whatever you know that all that's all there and that's all shared but that's as far as we can get. We can't get beyond that in any way. And I think that there's a great yearning amongst a lot of people to simply get beyond. I, there's, a, there's a growing sense that we're not going anywhere. There's a, politically, there's a general sense of frustration. Nothing really works. Nobody really wants to listen. Um, it's so hard to, to you know, facts become irrelevant in certain contexts and you go, oh, well, that's not going to help us at all. 
and we all we all feel that and, and it's very nice that when we have these opportunities like we do tonight to sit down and actually open up to other things and find a way to express that um, Doug brought up an, you know to me an important point Castro talks about mind the word mind it's just a word on the one hand but some languages don't even have that word it's not there. Germans don't have it. <laughs> they, they, well, well they, they have it, but it is, uh, can be interpreted also as spirit. And that's, well, the yeah, they, that's the thing. They have a word, and it could be this, but it could be that, which mm -hmm. I like, because that's mm -hmm. open on the one hand. That kind of opens it up a little bit, because most people, English speakers, that's, that use the word mind, I'm not real clear that they're clear on what they're saying when they say it. It's, but it is a nice, it's a nice bucket to throw things into that you don't know what to do with other ones. Yeah, because so a lot of times Americans interpret mind strictly in rational thought, as rational thought. That's, that's it, not right. anything beyond that. That's right, Michael, and the Germans have a word for that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's yeah. why we have things like vernunft. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a better word because vernunft yeah. uh, is more on the rational uh, level. Yeah. It does not yeah, it, indicate it some spiritual. Yeah, right. yeah but, but, but uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. And I'm sure that in, in other languages, you know, we got we got Spanish, Portuguese, Finnish. We got we got people here. That, what what do you what do you do in your language circles to address that? Do you, you know, kind of circumscribe it? Uh, do you just use the English word? Um, these are not things that are absolutely essentially important issues, but they are, I think, I think our discussions here amongst us will be informed by these because we all know that we're kind of coming at this from slightly different vantage points. Well, you know, we're not all at the same, and I'm not saying baseline in a sense that there's some standard that we should be at to go at it from. I think it's good that we don't have that. that that's, the part, that's kind of self-defeating when everybody starts from the same place. You know, this isn't a race. We're not, you know, nobody's gonna win in the end because there's nothing to win, but there is a lot to gain by this interaction and going through this. There's That's, also a, there's also had a lot to lose. Well, depending on how much you're betting, John. <laughs> well, I, I'm just looking at the world I live in. I live in Manhattan, and I yeah. see um, <laughs> a, a lot of uh, mindless competition for <laughs> scarce right. resources. These yeah. beliefs are, run very deep in the culture that I'm uh, a member of, and it just seems ridiculous how people are putting blinders on and their, uh, their very narrow um, external focus uh, cuts them off from, you know, uh, fields of investigation that they could explore if they were asking a different set of questions and operating with a different set of presuppositions. So I, 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 am, I do think this is urgent and not just academic because I think we, we need to really get it if not right, at least better than we're doing right now. Um, because I don't think we have a whole lot of wiggle room. I've heard recently we have about uh, 30 harvests left, according to um, Douglas Rushkoff. Okay. Um, that's about 30 years. And then the topsoil will be kaput. <laughs> so I, so I think we do have to change our thinking and it's going to be extremely painful for most of us. Well, and, 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 and John, I think you hit a point that, you know, there is something to lose. And I think we need to entertain, maybe we need to lose some things so that we save ourselves. I think part of the thing we're hanging on to things, and we're so afraid to lose the things we're hanging on, it creates these blinders, you know, so that idea of loss, I know the way you framed it, and I don't disagree with it, but I also am flipping it of part of that is we do need to lose some, we, we do need to honor the sense of loss of the ways that we've been doing business. 
Yes, but if you if you realize that what you lose is not something precious, but some a chain, something that bow, binds you, something that puts you in a cage. If you lose this cage, then it's it's quite a good thing. The problem is then, especially when it comes to these these philosophical discussions, when physicalists, I think, they are afraid uh, to lose. Um, they are afraid that to discover that they that their belief system was I don't say the wrong one, but not really even not the right one. Huh? But and it has we... imprisoned them in a way, Marco. It's imprisoned yeah. them. So there yeah. is this in in unloading the cage. There is going to be this. Uh, it's part of it. There's a term for it. Getting used to not living in a cage is scary. I don't know if you yes. were going that way. Of course, of course. But if you don't realize that it is a cage, okay, if you realize okay. that it's a cage, you are okay. happy that you have been freed. And yeah. and I think this is something that it is an inner movement. Here again, we are in a non-materialist. There is something <laughs> yeah. in the soul, I think. Yeah. Uh, or, in, or or I don't know, in our emotions. Put it like like you wish um, that must make a sort of movement and see things from another point of view and then you can be happy that you have been freed from this cage and right, I think right. physicalism yeah. is a cage yeah? and, and you know it's 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 not easy to give up a belief system if you have believed uh, to it for all your life you have made a career on it and now you are maybe in 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 are older uh, and uh, now you discover that what you believe you you believes were not really the yeah and I, i'm just going to add a, a layer to this without dismissing you but mm -hmm. i think there's this transition of healing the trauma of living there's a traumatization of living in a cage mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and there's this transition we have to move through i'm just adding to what you're saying if that's okay yeah, absolutely. Yes, it, 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 it is a transition, and um, it is also a trauma. There, there are the question of traumas is what would be, need uh, an entire session. I think it's, it's also a very complicated issue. But um, if I may add one thing, I I also agree very much on this thing, uh, on the um, word mind. That's something where I have some trouble. Uh, in in following uh, Kastrup uh, with his concept of universal mind, uh, I mean it, it it depends what we mean uh, by mind. Uh, but if we mean the human mind uh, and put this in the center of the universe uh, and universalize this this human mind to everything there is. Uh, well, they, then I have a problem. If I found this an extremely anthropocentric idea, and I would certainly not agree with that, at, l at least not in that form. And I, I don't, from reading Kastrup, I don't uh, know if what he really means by mind. If he means that, uh, I mean, look at what a mess um, mind has caused in our society. Yeah? And... Uh, on this planet, we, we cited already the, the, the question of the environment. Uh, mind is a very limited cognitive function, uh, uh, which has caused a lot of havoc in our history, in human history. And therefore, I can, where I cannot follow him really is that this, for me, cannot be the ultimate thing. And because this little thing we call mind is supposed to be enthroned uh, to a universal mind, or mind at large, as he calls it, uh, to a sort of divinity. Uh, the, this mind is supposed to be a creator of the universe. I mean, I, say, I don't think this can work, let alone control this, this universe. So um, I think this is also some, somehow in contradiction with, with, with evolution, if, if we believe in evolution at least. Uh, we should not forget how that cognitive function we, we call mind 
emerged from an evolutionary process only very recently. And if one does not embrace creationism or other anthropocentric uh, conceptions uh, which deny evolution, uh, one must obviously conclude that this mind, I mean the human mind, is only a passage, a momentary wave in a history of evolution. It can't be still the fully developed way of knowing the world. And to consider if the final, uh, ultimate apex uh, <laughs> of evolution is against the very principles of evolution itself, I, I believe. And um, yeah, so I have a problem to posit that as the ultimate primitive of all existence. Um, yeah. I think that's great, Marco. Uh, you, you said physicalism is a cage. Um, the, it was mentioned that they were, were I think, in a transition. Um, because if the cage, and you've lived in the cage, and you've adapted to that cage, and the, suddenly the door is open, and you're told you have to get out of it, what's going to happen next? Um, is that, uh, does that create a panic to the one who is, who's has lived in that cage? Do they want that extra, do they want that freedom? Um, I, I think that transition is, is something that, and I, and I appreciate that metaphor that you're using. Um, and you've also mentioned the inner uh, plants, uh, the inner life of plants, and there, there's, there's some evidence that plants make decisions, as you say. I think it's some a botanist from Yale who's working on this. <clears throat> but I think it's a, a fascinating to think about the, the overlaps between the human, the plant, the animal, different communication systems, um, the, the cellular level, um, and uh, you know, the level uh, that we operate in in our, in our social systems. And it's you know, that idea of incommensurability, that we're, we're looking at all of these different levels and what's in between these levels, and how do we coordinate um, these information systems, which are just bombarding us every day with, with different kinds of data. Um, Anyway, I'm just hoping that I, uh, opening that up because I think that's a extremely interesting, and um, to hold these questions and to hold them lightly, um, I, I actually don't think I think a Bernardo would agree with you um, from the previous books that I've read. I have not read this book, and I'm looking forward to to jumping into it. Uh, but anyway, thank you, thanks. And if anyone else has something different they want to offer, I'd love to hear it. And Marco, are you here? Did Marco Morelli arrive? Um, I see. I, I think it's Doug. He, he, he oh, he's Doug. On. Okay. Yeah, his, his, he, he was on his phone and he doesn't have a charger. So he, I just he, saw Marco Morelli's uh, icon there. So I thought maybe he was here. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's Doug on the oh, laptop okay. listening in. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I don't, I don't want to contradict what you said, John. And I, and I want to enhance what you said in, in addition to what Marco was saying. In, in Bernardo's defense, and as a major criticism at the same time, <laughs> it, it's one of those things. You, you put your finger in the wound. This, I, I hate, I personally, as a Eng, native English speaker, hate the word mind. I think it's one of the most meaningless concept notions that we've come up with. We use it, it's that catch, it's a bucket, you can throw things in, you can do with it what you want, whatever. Everybody understands it a different way. And he, he does say in, at the beginning, I'm, I'm going to do a couple of quotes here. We don't have to, but on page six, he says, a universal phenomenal consciousness is the sole ontological primitive. Whose patterns constitute blah, 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 existence. Okay. So a universal phenomenal consciousness. And then on page 10, he says, I use the word consciousness and mind interchangeably. And right there, I could have thrown, I could have thrown a book at him. I was like, why would you do that? You were, so, you were so particular. Just, I don't care that you have to type three words instead of one. <laughs> you know, don't, don't get lazy. There's a couple of places in here where I, this is a, just a subjective feeling, right? That he got lazy. <laughs> 
You know, it's like, no. Michael had pointed out there's a certain rigor that's here. And the rigor is, is nice, and that's appreciative. And I, I think that's part of the game that it gets played. But, but just do it. So if you mean a universal phenomenal consciousness, I don't care. You can, you can abbreviate that UPC as far as I'm concerned. You've defined it. You've said what it is, what you mean, and then go with that. And then you don't have all of these. We have, all, all of us have. John does. I know I do. Marco, you pointed out that you do. We have these negative connotations that come across when that word mind falls somewhere. Well, then don't use it. Just to, you know, there's some things, sometimes it's good to avoid. I mean, we may not want to avoid the, avoiding anomalies isn't necessarily beneficial for anyone, but avoiding confusion is. And this is one of those cases where just be consistent, use it as you're going through, because he doesn't really mean mind as anybody might understand it, generally speaking. But when you use the word, you have to know that's how people are going to react to it. And that, and that does, in some of the points throughout the, the book, kind of weaken the impact of what it is that he's trying to do. I, that, you know, I, I would agree on that point. But once we're, if we are all aware of that, keep that in the back of our own, <laughs> this is one of those times where you use it of our own mind, that is whatever's going on in my head, <laughs> when we're talking about this, then then we keep things relatively um, ordered, and we don't get too confused by things. Yes, and I, I, I say also that if you mean something else by some wor a word that others mean, then say it. Explain. You can also use the same word, but say that you mean something else. But I'm not sure that, that it, because he never does this. He just uses his word and says, everyone knows what his mind is. And then I, I have a problem with that. And, and, and also this idea to conflate mind and phenomenal consciousness. I don't know. Mm, for me, consciousness is one thing and mind is another thing. Mind, you can have very... A lot of thoughts, uh, coming and going thoughts in your mind, but in the background, the, the witness is always the same. So they, the, the consciousness and the mind, it's very questionable if these are the same thing. Um, yes, on, on this, I, I agree, he's very slippery, he's very unfocused, and, and he gives for granted that others understand what he means, but I don't think so. Yeah, and that, that was my problem. He says, he says it right up front, but through the rest of the entire thing, you know, so we're in the first 10 pages and he makes it, yeah. like he said, if you do mean something else by that, make clear which, what that else is. He doesn't. Yeah, do but also, also calling universal phenomen phenomenal consciousness. My and God. then, mm -hmm. huh? I agree yeah, with you. It, it, was, it, you were. I, I take this from what you read now here, and um, and this is mind. Okay, then let's see it. But let's explain this. I mean, I have no problem to 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 see the uni that the universe might be controlled by some higher cosmic intelligence. Uh, that's okay. Uh, I mean, as a Albindonian, of of course, I must. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite obvious that, that, that I, I agree with that. But that certainly can't be a mental intelligence. It must be something that goes way beyond mind. Yeah. And then we not, should not call it mind, even not universal mind or mind at large. Well, you said intelligence. You used intelligence. Is, is there a relationship between intelligence and mind? Yeah. And also, yeah. which audience are you talking to? Yeah, I think I think he's admitted he's talking to an academic audience for the benefit of a non-academic audience. So I think these are all very uh, useful uh, insights you're you're both providing, Ed and Marco. Mm. Uh, but I think we also have to appreciate who his primary opponents are. They are people who say there's no such thing as a mind. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, these, okay. It's a pet phenomena. It's like steam coming off of a kettle. Yes. It doesn't exist. 
Now, okay. when you're dealing with someone like that, you may have to use vocabulary in a very pointed way. Um, and that's very different from maybe a lot of how we would use mind mm -hmm. or drop it and use something else like intelligence uh, may have a more useful application for our purposes. But I think it's just very slippery. And I also wonder if defining a word actually leads to any clarification. No. We can all go to a dictionary um, and uh, look up definitions. And yeah, where does, how far does that get us? You know, it's tricky. One of the points I, I think is, he does say a universal phenomenal consciousness. We, we have to piece the meanings of those words together to come up with some idea of what it is that he's talking about. I think, I think mind obscures it because of all of the other things that can happen with it. That, that was, that's, that's my problem. And even if you redefine it and say, when I use it, I mean this, I don't think that's particularly helpful because people, all, people are always gonna slide down their slope of their own understanding of things. We have that on the other hand. So even though he's talking, and since he is talking to me, since he is talking to a particular audience that lays particular value on the clarification of concepts, then on the one hand, he needs to define what he means by mind. Mm. And it would probably be helpful if he defined what he meant by universal phenomenal consciousness, but even if he didn't, he's probably closer over there than he is here. I mean, the, the, the subtitle of the book bothered me when I saw it. You know, I thought, oh, an ideal world, that's very nice. And then he goes, here, for the mental nature of reality. And I'm going, eh, eh, why? why? Why does it have to be mental? M mental has connotations in it. But I understand, I understand on the other hand, why one would do that in this particular context, publishing a book for academics and not, he's trying to get, he's trying to get non-academics to, to, to come along, like you pointed out, to come along in what's a, otherwise a completely academic world that nobody gives a shit about for the most part. No, nor normal people, only, only us weirdos. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for that, Ed. I appreciate yes, that. We'll dance around, yeah, we'll dance around in that, in that, and then go back out here in, in the real world somewhere, as I like to say that, in IT. Yeah. This right? reminds me of Marshall McLuhan's little thing of we create tools, and they're, thereafter they shape us. And it's like going to Jamie used Galileo and the and the te, uh, the telescope and. I appreciated the metaphor, but part of me was going, what the fuck is a telescope and how do I use it? I don't even know how to use it. You know, when you're coming in contact with somebody that has a certain, uh, like John, you know, I have the utmost respect for John in theater. I've been in theater, but I know that John has more experience than me. And so I have to, I'm not gonna bow to him, John. Sorry, I'm not bowing to you, but I'm gonna, re <laughs> I'm gonna respect, his knowledge and experience. I think some of the times there's that there's that tension of 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 in and the you in the way we use language and mm -hmm. you know language is a tool. I mean uh, on this site that's a lot we've talked about how our personal this is my subjective experience uh, our personal idiosyncrasies of how to use language and sh at the same time share a conversation we do that but when we recognize that someone else might let's say be more adept or capable or qualified we defer right, that's, right. That's, i understand we defer to that but at the same time um, i think what daniel's point was there was a telescope and galileo did see something and yeah. when he offered someone else to look, they said, I'm not even going to look. And that yeah. was the problem is the not wanting to look. You're always willing to listen. You're willing to engage and going, okay, doesn't make sense to me. We'll come back to this later. You know, that's being very, as the Germans say, vernunfti. That's being very reasonable about things. But yeah. when you're in an unreasonable situation like the Inquisition, yeah. well, then you would expect unreasonable behavior. Well, so your, I won't, your point, your point is, your point is taken. I take your point, uh, uh, and it's a good point. 
I just know that from my experience, mm -hmm. when I encounter something new that scares the shit out of me, I'm less likely to be open. Right. This is true. But the difference between you and the Inquisition is I'm less likely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ed. That's why, that's why you ne never would have made it into the Inquisition, Michael. <laughs> no, I would, have, I would have been Genghis Khan on their ass. I, I want to, because um, we're almost 10 minutes before the hour, and if there's anything that you've learned today that you would like to share, I would love to hear that. Um, if there's something you know now that you didn't know before this call started, that would be really cool. And because I just wanted to give everyone, especially uh, Daniel and, and is it Jamie or Jaime? How do you pronounce your name? Anyway, I'll find out. But anyway, I want to hear uh, a, a little bit about if we're getting ready to get close to summarizing and thinking about the future sessions and what we would like to have happen in those future sessions and any scheduling. And also to let everybody know, if you don't know this already on the forum, you can, um, you can post post something that you want to write or speculate about or ask questions. Or you, if you see a, an article that you think is useful or a video, you can all post it there. So, and then we, we can continue the conversation online uh, between these face-to-face -face sessions. Okay, thank you all. And I've learned a lot today. <laughs> I'm still working on it, but I, I find this, uh, uh, for me, um, what I didn't know, what I do know now that I didn't know at the beginning of this call is that um, uh, that there, there, there are multiple metaphors that are brewing, I think, in, in this landscape that we're creating together. And I want to very gently, when I, when I come across something, a, a metaphor that wants to emerge or could emerge, I wanna point that out. Uh, just as I did when I heard our friend Marco talk about the cage. I say, ah, physicalism is the cage. I just want to point that out. Thank you. But in my case, it was suggested by what Michael said, that, or Ed, I don't remember, that there is not only something to gain, but also something to lose. That's an aspect that I, I, didn't, I didn't think about. And that's what I gained today. I don't know what I lo lost, but better not to know. <laughs> You're muted, Daniel. Hi, uh, yes. Uh, well, just wanted to thank. I learned uh, about uh, the community, uh, how to, about the sharing, how we are approaching this from um, apparently different angles, but aiming at the something, something similar there. And I'm looking forward. So is that so that we're going to move forward on the book, on the next chapters? Is that the plan? Um, uh, if I if I could just throw that in there, I was my my basic conception was that about every two weeks we would deal with one part of the book. So the next time would be part one, where he kind of raises the objections he has to physicalism. So we talked about where we are, what's Castro about, you know, what's he interested in. As Marco pointed out, there's points of critique that we can they can raise sometimes he's not real clear with his vocabulary those are nice things and good things to keep in mind we all kind of generally agree that a different way of approaching reality wouldn't be too bad i think that's fair to say um, we're all very interested in exploring that more and we all have uh, as you pointed out again different different vantage points that we bring to bear, we, 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 we kind of focus in and we raise those things and others pick up on them, you know, whether it's the cage metaphor, that was, that was a great one, that was the one for me too, um, you know, because you gain, you lose. The, the, 
And it's not, and the interesting thing is, it's not necessarily a zero sum gain lose uh, on top of that. So, you know, there's that added um, aspect to it. So the next time, um, the, I, my idea was we could read part one. I'd kind of summarize that overview chapter. Uh, we can look at what, what his critique of physicalism is, and we could approach that again in the next session, similar to today, in a, in a generally organized free-for-all where everybody kind of just, you know, brings himself to bear on the matter at hand. And we can exchange through that and, and you know, because I found this tonight, for me it's a tonight, for you guys it's not, Michael, it's, <laughs> you're at a different time. But um, for me, it was very, it's very rewarding to see these different inputs that come and the different topics that are, really side, to the side top, for me, the side topics are always as interesting, if not more interesting than the main topics. So what, the concept, what are the societal consequences? How does this play out in real life? What does this mean um, elsewise? What other, what other means do we have to approach this? Are, you know, is it through substances? Is it through meditation? Is it through, there's lots of ways to do this. How does that all fit in with what it is that he's trying to say, what point it is that he's trying to make? So, so his, his book has become richer because now I have a variety of ways. When I go back and re I read the the book, but I'm going to reread those chapters, but I'm going to reread them in light of our discussion this evening. So I'm going to have a different mindset in the second reading that I go through. And that's, and I think that's going to bring me benefits for sure. I don't know if I have anything to say that might be a benefit to everyone else, but one can always hope. Okay, so that's, that's how, kind of how I see things moving forward. So to pick up on what John had said, just from a purely administrative side, anything that you think about, the links that, that Jaime talked about, um, post them in the, on, on this thread on, on the conference. Uh, anybody that has anything to say, if you know, on, on um, Friday you said, oh, I, I was thinking about this and I didn't even mention it, drop it in the conference. I'm going to set up a page for the next session to outline what we're going to do and how that's going to happen and what's going to go on. That's kind of the administrative side of things. But the idea is if that's, um, and, and again, scheduling can be talked about in the conference as well. I and also think, just added that they're going, we're going to upload this video. So this if there's video something will that you missed. Uploaded, yes. Yeah. yeah it'll Doug, be posted Doug, on YouTube. He said so you can he always, will, that's a record right. that we're keeping. So you can always you check can, out the archive. Show up can show up in the conference, Doug said he'll have the recording processed and posted sometime within 24 hours. So if you missed anything or want to review something that we talked about this evening, you can watch yourself in, in, in real life. Again, I know John goes through these no, things. I don't. With a fine <laughs> I, tooth comb. <laughs> I, 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 for, I forget almost everything I say in these. I know. And then minutes. Then but when I look at the archive, I hear what everybody else said that I missed. And so I think it's a, a, a very good use of our technology when we have this as a tool to, to reflect have, on our own performance here. So we're going to meet in two weeks. That's the plan. Unless and anything the, the time might might be adjusted for other it, people. It might be. It's, it, I, I'm very encouraged by the fact that we have a lot of Europeans. <laughs> I, I am too. I am too. Before we, I before we leave, though, I didn't hear from Jaime, and I didn't yes. hear from... I'm going to speak. Yes. I, was declaring, I was just trying to answer Daniel's question on, on what, what's, what's a normal process. Yeah. It, that's kind of how I see that. If you, if there's anything else you want to share, Jaime, or yes, no, who else just is on so, the call? Yeah, yeah. So j just what, um, so what I'm, le uh, what, what I learned. Um, actually, I, I even I wrote it down because uh, it made me think uh, initially a bit, John. Uh, your point about the met metaphors, okay, and how actually um, science, religion, arts, etc., uh, work uh, through metaphors and. Um, uh, so I, I, I wrote that down because uh, I, I thought it was really a very interesting uh, thought and, and perspective, and I, I would really reflect on that. But uh, also resonated with me because um, 
um, so as, as I explained before, I was a hardcore materialist, atheist, uh, and, and I, I changed radically in all, you know, the isms. Uh, so, um, and one of the things uh, uh, that today, for example, I go to church and, uh, and uh, um, si since a while already, and especially since uh, also I started a bit um, getting uh, uh, deeper with idealism and Castro, uh, and also rediscovering also some other idealist uh, philosophers. Uh, this metaf metaphor uh, thing uh, in in the uh, you know in the scriptures etc. It's you can see that and and, uh, and now I see it with a completely different lens and and a different perspective. Um, and uh, so it, I, I will really uh, I, I'm glad that you mentioned that because uh, it's something that um, uh, it it will make me think uh, quite uh, quite a, a while right and then the other thing uh, uh, Ed, that you mentioned about the language um, actually with um, uh, on on this particular uh, term mind uh, you are right know that in german it's uh, it's different and probably um, in spanish we have mente and espiritu so to differentiate between mind as a rational mind and a spirit as more the spiritual and uh, you know, uh, subjective, if you want, experience. But in, in German, it's not that, I believe, with the word Geist. So, uh, which also, I think it's a, a very important point to take into account how language is also uh, um, um, a kind of a culture uh, framing, right, of, of our minds. So, um, yeah, uh, so those are the two things that uh, I got. And of course, uh, the, the fact uh, that you, uh, to, to know you guys and also see the, the very different backgrounds in the end that uh, we we seem to be united by the by that kind of a, you know um, uh, tend to to to, to um, think that idealism it's um, it makes sense right I also like very much John your uh, initial short dissertation around is it idealism the opposite of, of materialism or is there anything else etc and by chance today i read somewhere twitter or somewhere in one article hegel i don't know if it was quoting hegel or it was like hegelian thinking about uh, materialism as the thesis uh, idealism as the antithesis and he came out with this you know hegel uh, kind of, it's not pan citizens, but uh, with these monads thing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So, um, I, I, to be very honest, I need to get into Hegel a bit. I know Me that too. It's not, it's, it's not easy. And that's we need, it, a, we way, need a Hegel support group because it exa can really exactly, drive you crazy. <laughs> exactly. By the way, one of the things that I believe, um, uh, turning back to Castro, that I really uh, love is that he speaks the language of today, because sometimes I have hard. Uh, really uh, time to to understand some of the you know uh, philosophers especially german especially german philosophers by the way <laughs> you know because it's uh, the language and the and the, and the way that uh, they they explain things is so you know uh, i i don't know it's it's difficult it really i, I get a hard time and Castro, I feel he speaks with the language of, of today. Sometimes he's technical, but uh, I mean, at least for me, um, for me, it's it really it's something that I can understand very well. And this is something that I really appreciate because, uh, by the way, I don't know since probably I don't know what was the last philosopher, you know, really as a philosopher covering a broad range of topics. Um, that uh, that we have, but uh, frankly, it seems that it's been a few decades without really uh, uh, a big uh, figure in philosophy, as we know, uh, as the, the 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 concept that we have as a philosopher, not a very specialist one on a certain you know um, uh, aspect of philosophy. So having, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, where he's gonna get right uh, he's still hopefully many years of, of life ahead of him um, but I think he could become uh, really uh, uh, one of these big figures and illuminated figure in a wide uh, range of areas and uh, also make uh, people really understand 
uh, you know, philosophy with a new language that we got today, and also updated, you know, with a scientific uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, situation uh, or uh, that we are today. So I'm I'm really I'm really uh, glad. Um, yeah. So looking forward to uh, to continuing uh, the discussion. Thank thank you. Thank thank you all. Anyone else? Uh, I just want to say I uh, it, it's just been uh, totally uh, enthusiastic to to bring so many people that are in different places in the world. This is just as phenomenal to me to listen to all of your voices. So thank you. Okay. Well, if no one else has anything, I'd like to thank you all for showing up and for being such active participants. This was great. This was a real, this was a real nice way to spend a Tuesday evening, I can tell you. <laughs> oh, from California, all I can say is hang 10. Hang 10. Yeah, see you okay. later. We'll from see Manhattan, you. too. Hang in there, Bye. guys. Bye-bye. Bye. And later, dudes. Thank you. Thank you.